Good evening. On behalf of the McMaster Office of Alumni Engagement, I'd like to welcome you in joining us for tonight for our special event, Appetizers for the Mind. This webinar is taking place in the Psychology Building at McMaster University, and I'd like to acknowledge that the McMaster campus sits on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. The territory was the subject of the Dishes One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resource around the Great Lakes. At McMaster, we start our events with a land acknowledgement to show both respect to Indigenous peoples and their enduring connection with their traditional territories and its histories, and as an important step in reconciliation. My name is Joe Kim, and I'm an associate professor in psychology, neuroscience, and behavior. And together with Katie George, we direct the McCall McBain Postdoctoral Fellows Teaching and Leadership Program. With the support of the McCall McBain Foundation, this Made at Home program is leading the training of the next generation of superstar professors and industry leaders. Our event tonight will give us a taste of the cutting edge research led by five of our program scholars. We'll learn about antidepressants in our aquatic ecosystems, insect infestation from climate change, the role of lifelong learning, the everyday chemicals we use, and better cancer treatments. Introducing our speakers and moderating tonight's events will be Katie George. Over to you, Katie. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you so much. So for tonight, we have an amazing lineup of five speakers from the McCall Bain Postdoctoral Fellows Teaching and Leadership Program. We're gonna begin the evening with a thought-provoking presentation by Dr. Andrew Thompson. Dr. Thompson is a developmental toxicologist who tries to understand how environmental chemicals can impact our aquatic life. Andrew is the proud father of twins, and their existence has led to his only hobby being that of sleep. In his presentation tonight, Andrew asks, what happens when neuroactive compounds from our antidepressants are not fully degraded and actually end up in our wastewater? And what impact might this have on our aquatic ecosystems? Join me now in welcoming our first speaker, Dr. Andrew Thompson. Uh, thank you, Katie. Uh, yeah, sad but true. That is actually my only hobby these days. And uh, what I'm actually going to be talking to you about is a lot of based on my doctoral work. And I'm going to try and convince you that there's more than just the price you see on an antidepressant bottle. There might be an environmental cost with our usage of these pills. My work basically started because of the pervasive issue of depression. Mental health is a huge issue for the planet. If we consider how many people are actually affected by mental health, we expect it to be higher than 250 million people globally. That's a staggering number. And we actually have to consider the stigma of it, where it's not really talked about, it's not really acknowledged. We kind of just kind of leave it to the side because we don't really want to deal with it. And it's a sensitive issue for a lot of people. And particularly in academia and in, in schools in general, a lot of it is overlooked. And a large proportion of the population is expected to have some sort of mental health disorder. Approximately 15% of North Americans turn to antidepressants when they have mental health issues. And why wouldn't you? We take these neuroactive compounds to cause elicit changes in our brain that, that bring us back to normal. They, they cease this debilitating disease that afflicts us. This, this is actually from a Colgate commercial, but the premise is the same, where you take these pills to be happier. But there was actually an issue with my previous slide, because I actually made that in 2015. And I like showing that slide, because this is when I really started my doctoral program. And that number has changed. It's actually gone up up to 5%, depending on where we look. And it's closer to 18 to 20% of North Americans use antidepressants. And that number has largely increased lately due to the thing you may have heard of, the pandemic that ended all of our lives for almost a year. But we have to consider that now we have antidepressants globally. People, doctors are prescribing these pills in nearly every country that I can really think of in Europe, in North America, South America, and so on. And we're using these pills to treat a wide variety of conditions, including, in, including seniors and children. So as these drugs have increased their prescription rate and their usage is now higher, we have to consider what's actually happening. These pills are done for this constant battle of light and dark, this, 
this chasing of happiness versus this debilitating disease that afflicts us in depression. And behind the scenes, we're actually being betrayed by our closest friend who's seen us in our darkest moments. That's right, the toilet. The toilet has seen you at your worst. And unfortunately, these neuroactive compounds that we take willingly don't actually fully get degraded by our body. We don't break them down fully. And as a result, we're finding them in aquatic habitat because our wastewater system doesn't fully remove them. So we take these pills, they don't fully break down, our friend betrays us, and now we have these contaminants in our water. And in the water, we have to start asking, if they're there, what are the impacts to aquatic life? And as a developmental toxicologist, I have a preference to look at fish. And it's, they're a really good marker of the health of our aquatic ecosystems. And when we think of what we could actually be looking at, we have to look at the fact that the, we take these pills to be neuroactive in us. And I want you to take just a second here and to look at this video. This is just a demonstration of every neuron being born in a zebrafish, which is a type of fish, a model that I use for a lot of my research. And every lesson that we gain from this animal, we learn that the systems that we share, this neuroanatomy, this neurobiology is very similar. And what I like to do is to look at the neurobiology in terms of how it could be affected by something like antidepressants, and then see how does that translate from that early system to later behavioral differences that we may see. And this is just an example of, of some of the data points that I've generated. What you're looking at it's basically anything that you can see is green, is serotonin in the brain of a zebrafish. And when after I've exposed them to the antidepressant, I mean, it's like I've turned off the lights. There is an image there. I did not make a mistake. It is functionally there, but we've reduced the amount of serotonin in the brain by exposing them to the antidepressant. This is an extreme dosage, but this just shows the capacity of this drug in early life. And I also kind of segued that to see how... How does this affect neurodevelopment? And if we see these changes in serotonin, is there a change in the way that we can actually see the brain growing? And what you're seeing here is actually an unexposed fish for dopamine cells versus when they've exposed to Effexor, which is one of the more common antidepressants globally. We actually see a reduction in the amount of neurons formed as a result of exposure to this drug. So we see these changes in antidepressants or antidepressants causing these changes in the brain. And then we have to start asking the question, what does this actually mean for animal function? So looking at some of the cascades or some of the regions that were heavily impacted by these drugs, which are the hypothalamus and the pituitary, we started to ask the question, what systems that these, these regions govern, are they changed as well? And we looked at things like growth, and this was more of a research search that we did. We found that environmental levels of antidepressants globally, not even just the ones that I looked at, were sufficiently high enough to reduce growth in fish in a variety of different fish. So we're seeing this commonality where there's this reduction in their growth rate following exposure. Furthermore, when we look at things like reproduction and development, these antidepressants alter these simple systems. So the way this basic endocrinology that allows them to reproduce, hormones change, uh, development of the actual gonad changes following exposure to the antidepressant. When we look at something like stress, and we all are stressed. I'm stressed right now speaking to you. Cortisol, which is the, this main hormone that mediates how we actually respond to, to changes in our life, to stressors in our environment, the, the development of the system and the response of it is actually diminished following antidepressant exposure. So the capacity of these antidepressants is to actually change the basic endocrinology of fish. But I mentioned before that I really like looking at behavior. So we see this huge change in the neurobiology. We see this change in their endocrine systems. What does this mean for how they actually function? And in fish, you can't really go up to them and ask, hey, how are you doing? You stress me? We can look at things like courtship. So this is actually how they would interact, as you can imagine, to actually breed. And antidepressants at environmental levels are sufficient to actually change how they would respond in terms of courting a mate. We look at things like foraging. They can't go to Fortinos like we can. They actually have to hunt food. They have to have this drive to eat. And both of those are reduced following antidepressant exposure. And we have to look at anxiety-like behavior. And I say anxiety-like because I can't actually 
ask how they're doing in terms of anxiety. So anxiety-like behavior will be how they actually uh, avoid predation or how they hide. And what we see is that antidepressants at current environmental levels can actually sufficiently change these anxiety-like behaviors. So in general, the levels that we see now are sufficient to actually change their behavioral responses. And when we take this back to the start and we try to bring it all together and we look at ourselves in the mirror, we have to see that there's other animals too that share the same neuroanatomy, the same neurobiology, and are affected by the same drugs that we, we take to chase happiness. And we have to start to see, well, these antidepressant levels are so high and they're getting only higher because we're increasing usage. Is this going to start to impact the biodiversity of the planet that we all are almost tasked to protect? And then it kind of leads me to the next point. What are we doing with antidepressants? Because as more and more studies come out, we are prescribing these at a rapid rate. And in a lot of cases, the studies show they're not as effective. And, and we're prescribing them for nearly things that, in terms of mild depression and moderate cases of depression, that several studies have suggested that therapy is much more effective to work on. So maybe it's time for a gut check. And for us to see if we have to start as a society, start to reinvest in therapy for everyone. And I hope I've at least raised some provocation in your mind that it's not just antidepressant or the price on the antidepressant bottle is all we have to pay. Because if these trends keep going, we have the potential to have a, an environmental cost that humanity is not willing to pay. And uh, recently published, an, I recently published an op-ed in the conversation. If you'd like to read more, there's links to publications in that. And I'll take any questions you have, either by email or now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Thompson. Such fascinating and really important research that you're doing. Now, we have a question from the audience. Can the results of your study potentially translate to non-aquatic mammals, including ourselves, humans? And if so, how? Uh, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, unsurprisingly, that's one I've heard a lot. Uh, and the short answer is no. I mean, we uh, the dosages that I've used are much higher than we would expect to see. And they were given in a very different environment where it's something like a zebrafish. They have a maternal deposit in the egg. And then that's it for the maternal influences. They're almost devoid for the rest of their development versus in humans where there's this consistent uh, uh, interaction with the mother in the terms of the fetus. But we also have to take into the fact that maybe we're not going to see the same levels of extremes, but everything we've kind of looked at, all these endocrine changes, all these behavioral changes, that's what we take the pills for. And if you look at uh, things like hormonal changes, those are very common side effects of antidepressants, including things like sexual dysfunction and changes in growth. So antidepressants have the capacity to do that. And it's, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be taking pills, but I'm saying that we should be paying attention to what they're doing. And you should really have the information from your doctor to make really educated choices. Well said. Thank you so much, Dr. Thompson. Our next speaker for the evening will be Dr. Jose Bermudez. Dr. Bermudez is currently working on forest biomass mapping for Canada's forested ecosystems. He describes himself as driven by his curiosity to improve himself, gain knowledge, explore, seek novelty, and to just be happy. Tonight, he will discuss the increasing global temperatures and the resulting increase in insect infestation. Looking at this insect infestation, we know that it impacts our forested ecosystems. You will learn how remote sensing technology can now provide important data for potential early detection that can allow us to monitor growing pest populations. Please welcome Dr. Jose Bermudez. Thank you, Gary. Uh, well, today I'm going to talk about the impact of climate change and, and defoliation caused by insects. So this is a topic that most people doesn't know. So most people when asked about climate change, and its consequence, normally think about the inter intense rocks, water scarcity, severe fires, rising sea levels, flooding, melting polar ice, and some other catastrophic consequences. However, another equally important consequence is the increase on defoliation that causes by insects. So in this image, we have uh, um, 
an example of how insects uh, is the, the list. And um, formally, the foliation is defined at the relative amount of missing middles or leaves in the sensible crowd as compared to a reference tree. So, what is the concept of the consequence of insect defoliation? Based in the worst cases, uh, some insects can kill trees across a large landscape during outbreaks, and also could compromise food security. So the insect is, is outbreaks if the the leaf of the the agricultural crop is gonna be a very worse consequence about it because we don't have food. This is a very complicated situation. So why does climate change affect insects defoliation? Well, uh, there is a direct correlation between the temperature and the, and the amount of insects. So as the, the temperature increase, the abundance of uh, the insect also increase. And this is because the insects are called blood, blooded. And that means that their metabolism and the activity is very greatly influenced by the temperature on their bodies. And the temperature of bodies is almost entirely dependent on what the surrounding on the environment is. So we can summarize this as a low temperature inhibits activity and higher temperature usually stimulates the animals. So one of the concepts of increasing the temperature is that the number of generation also increase because we are at the activities of the insect also increase. Uh, there, are, there are an expansion of the geographic range because some areas are not accessible for, for the insect. Uh, could be outbreak increasing the disease transmitted by, by the insect because we are more uh, transmitters, more vectors that transmit the, the, the diseases. Uh, also increase on the, in the Increase on the weathering survival, so that's because the reduction of the of the cold season, then you're gonna have more more insects and some other reasons. Okay, so why is it related to the climate change? The climate change, we said, it refers to the long term shift in temperatures and weather pattern. So uh, this a change on the, on the temperature can be caused by uh, variation in the solar cycle that be natural, uh, uh, or may be caused by humans primarily due to the burning of fossil. So that's one projection in increasing the temperature for the, the next century. So it's estimated of, uh, of increasing the temperature in the climate change indicate that in the last uh, a scenario we are going to have increase at five Celsius degrees in the, the next century. And in the lower scenario, if we reduce the consumption of the fossil burning, then it's going to reduce the temperature. So it's important to, uh, in the next generation, to look for alternatives in order to reduce the increase in the temperature, uh, burning less uh, fossils. So, what happened in defoliation in Canada? So it's expected that uh, defoliation in Canada uh, will be double or triple in the next uh, 50 years. Here we have an example of uh, an outbreak that happened in the, in the region of British Columbia in 1999, caused by the frost burden insects that uh, they were expanded for duration and then attack the trees that were located in these in these regions. So also by increasing the human traffic, maybe lead the position of S and some host plants flourish in other areas. And the, the human activity also going to contribute in increasing uh, this, this, um, the increase the, the, the region action, the action that going the insect going to have. Okay. So solution uh, in this case, early detection and monitoring uh, infectation is, is crucial. We need to do that in order to design policies to control the potential spread of insects over the next few years. And also, in basing this policy, to reduce the magnitude of damage that could this uh, could that insect could produce. So, but what happened? How we can monitoring like area for the season making? Here we have an example of a big area. So it's more it's almost impossible to access to the region and then collect information about the duration was affected or not for, by insects. So minor inspection is demanding and time consuming. Uh, it's difficult to access to some dense regions, and um, then cover area is infeasible. In this scenario, uh, 
we have uh, the remote sensing emerge that's a cost effective tools that uh, with, with this technology we can cover less areas uh, now we have free available image with the highest spatial temporal resolution that means that we can observe very in detail in the space uh, the information that is on the air and also with the higher frequency in time and these sensors are capable of capturing level in prevalent information so but this remote sensing remote sensing is formally is defined as the science of our obtaining information about an object area or phenomenon through the analysis of data acquired at, by a device without no contact so uh, we have different uh, sensors that we now satellites the new car has also sensors that they capture the environment without any contact uh, the uh, camera, the cell phone is also a remote sensing device. So based in, in, with, in this sensor, we perform some uh, preliminary studies in, of insect defoliation in the region of Ontario. And this we using some uh, data for a particular satellite, the MODIS data collection is an optical image. Based on this information, we extract some features that is related to the uh, spectral information and thermal uh, data. And using data from uh, that were collected manually from the province of Ontario, we train uh, in machine learning you know, uh, models, and then we can do this analysis and make some uh, predictions uh, around different places in, in all Ontario. So the preliminary result that we have, we have uh, this map that's where the blue colors indicate low probability of presenting uh, insect defoliation, and the red color indicates high probability of having insects. So we perform this analysis during the during three years, but we need to perform increase this extend this our study for for more years in order to consider more variables so one of the next step is to extend our analysis for one decade uh, perform field validation over normal monitoring region in order to verify that our model is predicted uh, have, have high accuracy in this predictions and also incorporate some measure or uncertainty uh, in the machine learning models. So this is our, our team that we are working in this project for the um, Gosamo Remote Sensitive Lab. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Bermudez. This topic actually really hit home for me. I know that I've seen some of those insect infested leaves in my garden. So um, looking at a question from our audience, it's one I've actually had before as well. Uh, in Canada, we are seeing an increase in many insect populations, including ticks, Japanese beetles, and tent caterpillars. Is it possible to use remote sensing technology to inform things like pesticide use or prevention? Well, and in the case of remote sensing technologies, we can have some information about the presence or not presence of these insects, depending on the, the, the sensor that we are using on and the, the data that is provided, because we, we need some uh, reference data in order to train the, the models to, ident to identify that uh, the insects. So in this case, it's, it's possible to, to do that, uh, depending on the technology that we are going to use to, to perform this analysis. Very good. Thank you so much, Dr. Bermudez. Next up, our third speaker of the evening is Dr. Harman Sidhu. Dr. Sidhu's research focuses on knowing the occurrence and fate of, as well as the risks from, organic uh, contaminants coming from the foothills of the Himalayas fueled his appreciation for Mother Nature, and he was motivated to pursue an environmental science-related career. Today, He's gonna to talk to you today about organic chemicals and things that we use in our everyday lives, how they can harm us, potentially our environment as well, and how we as informed consumers can minimize uh, their release into the environment. Join me now in welcoming Dr. Harman Sidhu. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Katie, for the introduction. Let's dig right in. Development has brought us many comforts from refrigerators and air conditioning to water and fireproof clothes, electronics, and sofa sets. 
though it comes at a cost, which among other things includes increased use of organic chemicals. Unfortunately, not all of these chemicals are good. Many pose known or unknown risks to human and environmental health. Have you noticed that with increased use of chemicals, incidences of diseases have been going up? Is this just a coincidence? Likely not. For instance, many fireproof materials are coated with a class of flame retardants called diphenyl ethers, which have been linked to reproductive issues, cancers, etc. Do you think we, did you know that there are a plethora of chemicals in products that we use in our everyday lives? Food and personal care products, such as toothpaste and shampoo, contain several organic chemicals, some of which are known or thought to be problematic. For instance, many shampoos contain paraben preservatives that have been linked with hormonal imbalance, also known as endocrine disruption in humans and other animals. And do you think we are done with these chemicals once we use these products? Well, think again. From our bodies and households, these chemicals end up in wastewater treatment plants, which are not very efficient in removing them. Consequently, these compounds end up in environmental compartments such as atmosphere, river and groundwater, and agriculture fields, from where they can cause host of problems, including food contamination and toxicity to non-target organisms. I'm a broadly trained environmental chemist who evaluates the presence, weight, and risk assessment of these so-called contaminants of emerging concern once they are released into the environment. The goal is to inform policies such as setting up pollutant limits to better safeguard us and our surroundings. It is a no brainer that limiting the release of such chemicals into the environment in the first place is far better than doing this, these risk assessment studies, right? Chemicals are often tested to predict their environmental fate and risks before commercial release. However, despite best efforts, chemical behavior in the complex environment over a long period of time can be hard to foresee. So post-release studies need to be conducted, especially when an environment shows signs of adverse effects. Now, can we as consumers safeguard ourselves and help prevent environmental release of these harmful chemicals that are present in food and personal care products? Short answer is yes. But before delving into how, I want to ask you a couple of questions. Do you consider yourself a health conscious shopper? Do you favor personal care products and foods that portray themselves as healthy and eco-friendly? And if you answered yes, how do you identify healthy and environment friendly products? Here are some considerations that can help one pick out such items. When choosing a product, the first thing to pay attention to is not the enticing claims on the labels, but the list of ingredients. Here, consider three things. The number of ingredients. Generally, the longer the list, the more processed, chemical heavy, and less healthy the item likely is. Then, the order of ingredients. The earlier the name appears in the list, the higher the concentration of the ingredient and then ingredients thought or known to be problematic, such as parfum, which is fragrance and parabens in this list. These problematic ingredients include certain preservatives, thickening agents, colors, and natural flavors. Chemicals such as parabens, monosodium glutamate, and phthalates are some famous examples of ingredients that may be linked to endocrine disruption, developmental problems, or cancer. 
the use of some of these ingredients is being restricted, but others are still being widely used. Most harmful compounds that are common ingredients in various products can be found on websites such as Environmental Working Group. Let's do an informative activity. Take out your cell phones and scan this QR code. It will take you to the Environmental Working Group website. Are you doing this? Okay, here on the top, you have a search option where you can get info, important information about any common chemical present in consumer products in general, less scientific words. Let's look up parabens. Just type parabens into those search option. You got some informative articles on parabens, right? You can read such articles and be better informed. Did I scare you? Well, don't be. The concentrations of these compounds in most products are generally quite low. So you don't necessarily have to worry if you have been consuming these products so far. Still, you should stop now as not only does exposure add up over time, but also these chemicals can end up in the environment adversely affecting it and other organisms. Now let's look at examples of good and not so good pasta sauces. A good sauce will generally have less ingredients, no problematic ones, and less healthy products would be listed towards the end. Recall the ingredients are ordered based on their concentrations in the list. So from these pictures, it is evident that sauce on the right is much better than one on the left because it has less ingredients, all healthy ones, whereas one on the left also has sugar in it. While shopping, you are likely to see products labeled chemical-free, organic, antibiotic-free, etc. At a glance, they seem superior, but are they really? The labels such as 100% organic and raised without antibiotics are credible because those terms are closely regulated. On the other hand, commodities labeled natural are usually minimally processed, but may still contain harmful chemicals, antibiotics, and some other dubious elements. Items labeled made with organic ingredients and organic are permitted to contain up to 30% and 5% synthetic components, respectively. Similarly, chemical-free doesn't really mean anything. Almost everything we can see, touch, and feel is a chemical. Furthermore, claims such as heart-healthy and hypoallergenic are often backed by negligible and or biased research. Other products use marketing to imply they are healthy when they are clearly not. Did you know sugar-free cola contains artificial sweeteners that can be worse than sugar? These sweeteners can harm crucial gut microbes and some are even suspected carcinogens. If you want alternatives to sugar, look for re relatively healthy sweeteners like stevia. Fat-free products are not necessarily good for you either. When fat is removed from foods, the concentrations of sugars go up. So in summary, labels 100% organic and antibiotic-free are reliable. Organic and made from organic ingredients may contain synthetic materials. Chemical free and natural doesn't really mean anything. Heart healthy and hypoallergenic are often dubious and sugar and fat free are often unhealthy. The bottom line is being an informed consumer can help safeguard us and our surroundings against harmful chemicals. Always study the ingredients, no matter what the label says. Judge the concentration of various ingredients 
and do your research to assess the problematic ones. Keep these tips in mind, and I hope they help you stay an informed consumer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sidhu. I will certainly take another look at the products I purchase on my next shopping trip. Uh, I have a question from the audience. Is there a potential link to antiperspirants and breast cancer from the effects of the aluminum and the other chemicals? Uh, well, this is a very uh, burning question these days, but uh, people may not like the answer. We don't know. There is very little evidence to suggest that there is a link between for antiperspirants, uh, aluminum, and breast cancer. Though there are some studies that suggest there might be some evidence uh, to support this theory, but those studies are often flawed. For example, one such study used unrealistically high aluminum concentrations. And there are some studies that show there is no link. Those studies have their flaws as well. So at the moment, we really don't know if there is a relationship between these or not, but we really need to do research, more research to find out, to confirm whether this is a problem or not. Thank you so much, Dr. Sidhu. Fascinating research that you do. Next in our program, we have Dr. Emily Scherzinger. She's a postdoctoral fellow at McMaster's Children and Youth University, where she studies the intersection of disability as well as childhood. In her spare time, she likes to read, play the drums, and hang out with her blind dog, Atlas. Tonight, in her presentation, Dr. Scherzinger questions the underlying ideologies that found the framing of lifelong learning in Western elementary education. This presentation is part of a larger body of work that uses disability studies to reimagine lifelong learning, not as a marketable skill, but as a pedagogical framework that offers opportunities to empower individuals as well as their communities. Please join me now in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Emily Scherzinger. Thanks, Katie. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Emily Scherzinger, and today I want to talk to you about disability and lifelong learning policies in Western education. But I want to start with a bit of a story. By the time I turned 25, I had already broken 27 bones, not counting fingers or toes. Some of those breaks had come from frightful accidents, such as a broken arm from a cab driver hitting my bike. However, most of these breaks took place in more typical childhood circumstances. By the time I turned 25, I had already broken 27 bones. I just said that. But I was nine when I broke my first bone on a school skating excursion. The very first one, a fracture on my left wrist. I was trying to race the boys in my classroom in hockey. I was convinced I skated faster than them. Misevaluating where my skate was, I kicked off the ice and got caught on my toe. I slammed to the ground. My mother, of course, panicked at the sight of my grapefruit-sized wrist when I got home and swept me off to the hospital. Kindly technicians walked me through my first x-ray, and this was back when patients would carry their own files of x-ray images between hospital departments. Eventually, as the years wore on and the list of fractures grew, my mother stopped panicking over my broken limbs. My x-ray file became too heavy for me to carry. I learned how to pop wheelies in wheelchairs. The casting tech at the hospital even learned my name. I quickly became the adorable disabled person, appealing enough to the guilty consciences of able-bodied people because my disability always appeared to be temporary. The bone would heal, my cast would come off, I'd be normal again. I was always lauded for my resilience, for becoming ambidextrous at 12 years old. What these people didn't know or didn't see was the invisible disability behind these temporary injuries joint hypermobility, which some are now calling the bendy body disease. Celebrities are even sharing their diagnoses, raising public awareness about the condition. In an interview with Vogue, one of the world's biggest pop stars, Billie Eilish said, quote, I felt like my body was gaslighting me for years. 
The medical establishment is finally turning its attention to hypermobility disorders, including the one with which I've been diagnosed, which is hypermobility Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or HEDS. It's a genetic disorder typified by faulty connective tissue, which is a major part of the human body. Connective tissue makes up parts of tendons, ligaments, skin, and the digestive system. The weak connective tissue leads to hyperflexibility, which in my case culminated in large gaps between my bones, weak tendons and ligaments, and of course, like I mentioned, lots of broken bones, lots of dislocations. And having a bendy body has greatly affected not only my life, but also my research as an academic. I currently study how disabled students are excluded from lifelong learning. We often understand lifelong learning as independent learning, self-directed learning, and it happens over the course of our lifetime. It is, of course, an important framework, and it's becoming increasingly popular in Western elementary schooling. These policies encourage the production of a labor force that is flexible and able to pivot according to a company's whims. Lifelong learning has thus become an incredibly important trait in the job market. As Wendy Brown writes, quote, consumption, education, training, mate selection, and more are configured as practices of self-investment where the self is an individual firm. So in this way, education has been reconfigured from a path toward individual and community empowerment to an investment in the self's market value. Those who fail to invest properly in themselves are morally and quite literally bankrupt. And overall, this individualization of education influences the treatment of disabled people, especially medically and socially. As a broad instance, people with disabilities are encouraged to adopt this narrative in which they're responsible for their impairment and for then overcoming their impairment. But in reality, this localizes uh, disability. It's often intersected with societal and global factors. For example, the disabilities incurred from landmines in the Angolan Civil War are a direct result of American intervention in the country in which the CIA funded and supported anti-government rebels. Disability is thus intersected with varying factors like gender, race, colonialism, and more. Removing this context causes disability to be individualized. And this individualization works to marginalize disabled students in the education system as disability cannot simply be overcome. The Western educational institution relies on parameters of meritocracy, such as individual effort, will, and resilience to determine who is fulfilled and valuable and who is not. In this framework, Disabled children and youth are framed as these docile, unfulfilled bodies, and students who are potential lifelong learners are often those who strive individually outside of interdependency to function as these independent learning units. However, disability necessitates interdependency. After all, I can't feasibly carry out a plan to go for a bike ride the next day if I wake up unable to walk. So rather than falling into the trap of individualization, disability requires the fostering of collective care, which necessitates a variety of skills, such as community building, clear communication, adaptability, and of course, flexibility. In this way, disability is antithetical to individualization. Disability fosters collective dependence upon one another and uh, collaborative efforts rather than capitalist competition. After all, the skills and frameworks that come from living and learning while disabled are valuable and radical and liberatory facets of lifelong learning that capitalist agendas tend to suppress. So I ask, what if we use HEDS and disability more broadly as methodologies through which we critique the encroachment of economic ideologies on lifelong learning? What if we reimagine lifelong learning. What can we learn from the hyperflexible in an economic environment such as transnational capitalism, which demands these flexible bodies for flexible accumulation? 
Using disability as a lens through which we evaluate our education practices encourages necessary skills, such as the acceptance of difference and different abilities. Disability also encourages critical thinking that challenges the adequacy of our current educational structures. And finally, introducing disability justice in the classroom supports imagination, the opening up of spaces for different ways of being in the classroom and the world. Ultimately, I agree that we need justice within our educational system. As people who have attended this institution of higher learning, we need to recognize that education outcomes reflect the societal inequality for those perceived as different. As a postdoctoral fellow at the McMaster Children and Youth University, I research how we can introduce disability justice into educational frameworks such as lifelong learning. Lifelong learning is important and introducing disability justice into this demands that we take a look at what values underpin our educational system. Our values of capitalist accumulation and individualization truly the most sustainable practices to teach our children and youth. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much for such a powerful presentation, Dr. Scherzinger. Um, I think that you've really given everyone here a whole lot to think about. Here's a question from our audience. Can you think of some concrete examples of how public education systems can better incorporate a lens of disability uh, and disability justice in the classroom? That's a great question, Katie. One of the ways that we're doing that at the McMaster Children and Youth University is actually through the game Minecraft. Um, I succeeded in pursuing a grant where we are using Minecraft to build a school in East Hamilton so that the grade eight students who are moving into that school are able to access the school without actually even having to attend. They can uh, attend uh, assemblies, they can meet with their teachers through Minecraft and the best part is that the grade nine, tens, and elevens are actually building the school, the high school. So in this is really exciting for students that have mobility or accessibility issues, or even just for students who are scared or anxious and worried about not belonging. So one thing I would say, although this maybe isn't the most concrete, is fostering a sense of belonging. I think that is a really important way of using disability justice in the classroom. I absolutely love that. And I know my nine-year-old son would absolutely love that as well. <laughs> so thank you so much. Next up, our last speaker of the evening. So last but not least, certainly, is Dr. Afshin Abrashamkar. Dr. Abrashamkar's research specializes in developing microtechnology-based platforms for biomedical and healthcare applications. This includes tissue engineering and drug delivery. It was once called a citizen of the world by a very wise man. And although I don't know if I'm quite as wise as that man, I would certainly agree with that sentiment. In tonight's presentation, Dr. Abrashemkar investigates revolutionary developments in cancer therapy. When facing a devastating disease such as cancer, treatment options might actually be very limited. Many turn to things like chemotherapy or radiotherapy as popular choices. But is there another option that could potentially be more comfortable? Join Dr. Abrashamkar as he unfolds this very important question. Thanks, Katie, for the introduction. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for staying through the last presentation. I appreciate that. So as Katie mentioned, I'm going to talk about a couple of more recent and revolutionary treatments in chemotherapy besides the traditional chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Before diving into the treatments, let's talk about how dangerous cancer is. We are all familiar with cancer, but just to look at some statistics, Last year in Canada only, over 230,000 Canadians were expected to uh, be diagnosed with cancer and 85,000 were expected to die of cancer. So these are huge and sobering numbers, but in order to make them more tangible, it means that every day over 600 people were diagnosed and over 200 people died of cancer. And even going further with that, every hour, 27 Canadians are learning about their cancer and 10 lose their job, lose their life and cancer. It means that including the families, friends of the patients, over 1 million people face some challenges with cancer. So it kind of affects over 1 million people in Canada 
and it's only for last year and it's growing. And it is also based on the Canadian Society of Cancer is known as the leading cause of death in Canada. So out of four people, one of them who die, die of cancer. And it's not only for other people, it's closer, unfortunately, to what we think. So over around 40% of Canadians are expected to develop some sort of cancer during their lifetime, which means out of every five people, two of them will develop some, some sort of cancer during their lifetime. And despite of all these challenges and issues that we have in cancers, the more common therapies these days are radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and also surgeries, or in some sort of combination of these. However, they are being used in clinicals, but there are also some challenges with them. Just starting with chemotherapy, it was pioneered in 1940s, so over 80 years ago. So it is an old uh, treatment, although it has been refined consistently during the last 80 years, but there are some issues with it that we will get into. But also there's an interesting story behind this chemotherapy. You might have heard this, wherever there's a bad, there's all this good nearby. This is actually true for chemotherapy. So it all started with the World War I. So about a hundred years ago, there was some warfare that was used, the mustard gas and deadly agent that was used for deadly effect. And after about two decades, when, with the advent of World War II, there was some concerns raised about reintroduction of these chemicals. So actually people decided to shift toward like, looking into more research about therapeutic applications of this chemical, which was called mustard gas. So this research actually led to the discovery of another chemical that's called nitrogen mustard about the two or three years after that. And that chemical was actually learned to be something that could be used for chemotherapy. And about 80 years ago, chemotherapy was born. And since then, over the last 80 years, it has refined considerably, and it is still one of the mainstay for treating cancer today. However, as I mentioned before, there are some issues. Just to start with, do you know anyone who likes needles? Everyone hates needles. No one likes to be poked. And unfortunately, some patients of cancer, they have to be tr treated with administrative drugs using needles even up to daily. So just imagine that it could be very painful and uncomfortable. But besides this, there are also some other issues with it. For example, in chemotherapy, usually they use the highest tolerable dose of drug. And this comes with a lot of side effects. And also it compromises the patient's general health. And considering that we are using the highest tolerable dose, but it's still only less than 1% of the drugs reaches the tumor. So 99% of the drugs don't even make it to the tumor. So knowing that we need some improvement in this field. So this, this can be the only option. And if you want to do something in it, the improvements that we require should lead to providing a more efficient way to deliver tumor to deliver the drugs into the tumor. So it could penetrate deeper into the tumor uh, microenvironments. And also it should bring less discomfort for patients compared to the chemotherapy. So if you're looking for new ways and revolutionary treatments for cancer, it should meet three different criteria. So to be able to call it efficient treatments. First, obviously it should have increased response rate. So more patients should be treated when they undergo that treatment. And also it should bring less side effects compared to the, to the ones that we have now. And the third one, it should definitely reduce cancer mortality, which is quite high at the moment. Knowing this, these three factors, we should be looking at this area that all these have in common. So this is the area that we should be looking at newer and more developed treatments for cancer. So here are a list of some of them. Now we're starting with the microtechnology and nanotechnology as a promising method for cancer therapies. Macroengineering and macrotechnologies led to a new treatment that's called immunotherapy. It is not yet in clinical trials, but it is a very promising one and is coming to trial soon. Next, nanotechnology, going to a smaller scale, led to another method that's called chemotherapy loaded nanoparticles. It is already in clinical trials, this one, and is being used. In this case, for example, using gold nanoparticles, we would load the drug into the nanoparticles. And because they are super small, they can easily travel through the body and go into the tumor and they can penetrate deeper what they couldn't do without it. And then another one, which is definitely the most used clinical therapy at the moment is the liposomal anti-cancer drugs. This is already in clinical trials and it is very promising, but it's not the end. So we need more. 
the area of greatest potential for treating cancer is probably in more complex nanotherapies, still within the nanotechnology, but in a little bit more complex nanotherapies. What do we mean by complex nanotherapies? So it means that we somehow combine the drugs with the possibility to image the cancer as it happens, and also to heat generation being able remotely. So what does this mean? It means that we can administer the drug, so these drugs will work, and it will kill the cancer cells that are very fast growing, and at the same time, we are able to capture what is happening there. So it would be very cool to see if the drug that we administered can make it to the tumor and if it can do something for the treatment. And lastly, but not least, we all know about the mRNA vaccines due to the COVID a few years ago that we became, became familiar with. So it would be very cool if you would have something similar to that for cancer. There's actually some interest and some early success in using mRNA or cRNA methods for cancer treatments. So it would be very cool if you could make something for that for cancer. However, I want to make sure that it doesn't exist, unfortunately, at the moment, but there are, it's very promising and there are so many interesting research going on on that. So hopefully at some point in the near future, we'll hear some good news for that. At the end, I want to say that the cancer is still there and the fight against cancer is still ongoing. So to make this more clear, over the last 10 minutes of this presentation, unfortunately, five people just got diagnosed with cancer and two people died of cancer. And this is only for Canada. It is very sad, very sobering, and it's a huge number. But I don't want this to be the message that you take with you today. So just focus on this. Although there is these issues, but there are lots of other treatments on the horizon that are less uncomfortable and more efficient than the current one, chemotherapy and radiotherapy. So let us all be hopeful and keep our fingers crossed for these methods to come into the clinical trials. With that, I would like to thank you all for your attention and also for your kind patience at this time. And if there would be any question, I would be more than happy to take. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Avershamkar. So much to think about. I think this is really a topic that resonates with many, many people today, as you noted in your numbers. So a question from our audience has come in. Uh, the thought of a cancer vaccine sounds very exciting. Do you think that it might be met or received um, or even accepted by the public? Or might there be vaccine hesitancy like we saw with COVID-19? Well, that's a very interesting question. I think it is one of, one of the questions that we can answer for sure until we face it. So I would say, whatever I would say, it's just my opinion. I think compared to COVID, it should be less hesitation and resistant against it because firstly, cancer is the more known illness or disease than COVID. So for COVID, there was not so much information around it. It was not known to population. So there was more resistance. Also the treatments that were coming into clinical trials, they were not developed or researched for like long-term side effects. But I think for cancer, hopefully, because of the issues that we all are familiar and we are probably seeing around us, I'm hoping that there will be less resistance for that. But we will never know until we come to that. Thank you so much. Great answer. So if anybody in the audience has questions at this time, please type them into the Q&A and I'll have our speakers come up one by one and answer your amazing questions. All right. So looking ahead here, I see a few questions. The first question is for Dr. Thompson. So looking at your presentation, is there potentially a wastewater treatment option when we're talking about these neurochemicals that we have in our wastewater? Um, we, we like, not we, but like there's a lot of labs that are actually trying to use different techniques to treat wastewater um, in terms of adverse effects or actually removing uh, like things like antidepressants. It, they're actually highly effective, but they're <laughs> really expensive for us to implement on a large scale considering how much we go to the washroom. Um, so this is one one of the things that like in terms of feasibility, we don't really have any current options, but we're always working towards it. But some of the techniques, and I showed a lot of ad adverse effects where actually we had a collaboration with a group from Tel Aviv where we were able to use an ozonated compound. So they actually uh, apply ozone to wastewater and they were able to basically alter the antidepressant and it ameliorated or removed the effect so we were actually able to recover and 
rescue the negative connotation towards the animal, which is pretty cool. Very cool. Thank you so much, Dr. Thompson. Next up is a question for Dr. Sidhu. Other than parabens, what is the most prevalent harmful chemical that is used in our everyday lives? Uh, fragrance is, I would say, the most important one because it's in everything. Parfum, fragrance, you will find it in your soaps, your um, every kind of toiletries, and sometimes even in your food. So I would say you should be very uh, like clear to look for paraffin. It will be there in your foods, but it should be at the very end uh, with, con with concentration, uh, keeping mind in the concentration, right? Keeping concentration in mind, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so parabens and perfumes, stay away. And <laughs> make sure they're at the end, yes. Uh, all right, next up, we have a question for Dr. Scherzinger. Are there any places in the world that you know of potentially uh, that have educational systems in place that do a better job of being more inclusive um, and looking through a lens of disability? That's a great question. Um, honestly, I think that a lot, because a lot of my research centers on Western education, I feel comfortable speaking to that. Um, Europe has an incredible, very thorough policy on lifelong learning, but it does not include any disability justice. In fact, it it uh, advocates for the exclusion of disabled students, suggesting that they are not actually able to partake. However, what I will say is that Hamilton is doing an amazing job. Right now, Hamilton has some of the best uh, policies on mental health care for students, particularly in the wake of um, the pandemic and the return to schooling. I'm always amazed by the Hamilton Wentworth District School Board and at MCYU, we work really closely with them. So I see all the ins and outs of the ways in which they employ mental health care. One of the policies that they have, they call the one adult ally. And so they really encourage teachers and staff in to foster that sense of belonging that I was talking about um, with students. They've also employed uh, Black success scholars at uh, Bernie Custis High School. And uh, yeah, they, they're doing some really amazing work to bring disability justice into the school. Thank you so much. It's no wonder Hamilton's doing great. We have people like you, right? <laughs> Thank you so much, Emily. Uh, next up, we have a question for Dr. Abershamkar. There's actually a kind of a, a two-stage question, shall we say. Uh, would nanotherapies be a cost-effective way of treating cancer, and would it be cheaper than chemotherapy, which is extremely expensive? So that's a very good question. I think as long as these are in clinical trials, it will be hard to predict, but I guess, yes, it's gonna be cheaper because you will minimize the amount of drugs. And also considering that in chemotherapy, 99% of the drugs that we use don't actually effective. So yeah, definitely we're going to be saving a bit more. Wow, <laughs> that makes a whole lot of sense. There's one more question, so you're not out of the hot seat yet. Um, what about the use of viruses against cancer cells is the question. So I guess this should be what sort of virus, because virus can be used for uh, developing, uh, developing uh, what's called the vaccines for virus-based disease, but cancer is based on fast-growing cells. So I'm not sure if vi there would be any virus that could be used for that sort of vaccine. So that's why the mRNA and cRNA-based treatments and also hopefully vaccines would be the best better option I would say I don't have any information on a virus-based vaccine for cancer thank you so much Dr. Abershamkar and I want to thank everybody here for sharing space with us uh, and especially to our amazing speakers you all did it a very amazing job I feel like everybody deserves a, a hand um, so now where you're looking at uh this evening. Where else could you go to hear about such diverse research being done? Right here at McMaster University. From zebrafish to cancer to elementary education. I hope you enjoyed the talks just as much as I did. On behalf of myself, Dr. Joe Kim, 
the McMaster Office of Alumni Engagement, all of our amazing speakers, and of course, the McCall McBain Postdoctoral Fellows Teaching and Leadership Program. I want to thank you for joining us, and I hope everybody has a great night. Bye for now. <laughs>